Hey, you're watching part two of a series where I go over each mainline Assassin's Creed game. If you're interested in seeing what I have to say about the first game, there's a link in the description to the playlist. That or the top right of the screen here. If you're here from the first video or just don't care, let's get down to business. So, Assassin's Creed 1. A very okay game. Not good, not bad. It had room for a lot of improvements. So the people would wait two years to see if Ubisoft could do it. 2009 was the year we would receive the next game in the franchise. Assassin's Creed 2. Unlike the first game, this is one I've played before, along with every game after up to four. But it's been a long time since I've touched any of them, and I'm a bit curious to see if this one holds up. For memory, I really liked this game. While I had problems with it, it was still a really enjoyable experience. That, and this time they focused a bit more on characters than just the story itself. All that being said, I can be remembering incorrectly. Will it be superior to the first game? Well, all we can do to find out is to play the thing. So, last we left off in the story, Desmond was left alone in his little prison cell. Having just activated his eagle vision, he saw a huge cryptic message on his wall painted with blood. And that's when the game abruptly and shittily cut off. Assassin's Creed 2 picks up immediately where one left off. Lucy suddenly bursts into your room with blood on her shirt. The first thing you'll notice here is that they stopped with that real-time control your character bullshit. Now we have actual cutscenes with subtitles, might I add. Look, we have maybe 10 minutes. Maybe before they figure out what I've done. If we're not out of here and on the road before then. Wait, we're leaving? Desmond, I promise I'll answer all of your questions later. But right now, I need you to just shut up. All right, fuck you too then. We gotta take a quick dip into the Animus before we can leave. So, here we go. You'd think because Altair's story ended so suddenly, there was room to continue it for another game. But nope, fuck that guy. Now we're going 268 years into the future. Renaissance Italy. In the year 1459, a little baby boy was born. He's clearly healthy. Look at how he responds to the baby quick time event. What shall we call him, my love? Ezio. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. More like Ezio Auditore de France, am I right, Ubisoft Montreal? Get back to work. Well, enough of that, time to move. Getting downstairs, we can see that there are way more animuses. Wait, what's the plural of animus? Animuses? Animi? What do you think, Lucy? Lucy? Desmond, shut the fuck up. Uh, Alright, fuck you too then. Using Desmond's eagle vision, they figure out the password to the front door. Once hitting the garage, they get into a little fist fight. They had the guns to take on the assassins before, what happened to them? Pretty simple, same as the last game. Alright, we made it to the car, but still don't even know where we're going. Turns out, we've gone to an assassin hideout. With Abstergo having found the map of the Pieces of Eden, we're in a bit of a sticky pickle. The assassins are nearly extinct and we have no one good enough to stop the Templars. But have you noticed that Desmond could take on more than one security guard back there with his bare hands? That's because of a bleeding effect that the Animus had on him. While not a lot, he gained some experience that Altair had through being in his shoes. Perhaps we can get him some more experience through more experiences. Meet the other assassins, Sean and Rebecca. Sean is British and a prick. What's all this stuff for? This stuff, Desmond. Oh, this stuff is nothing special, really, this stuff. It's just the stuff that keeps our entire operation from falling apart, really. It requires a great deal of concentration to keep it all moving, so you'll forgive me if I don't have time to play meet and greet. A Simon Ramsey, if you will. He's the intel gatherer, the researcher. He'll give you info on some things you need to know about Renaissance Italy. And Rebecca over here, doesn't have a personality. In fact, now that I think about it, out of the four of us, Sean is the only one that does, and it's not a very good one. Rebecca is in charge of their modified animus, and you know she's the tech girl because she talks about the animus like it's a real person. I take care of Baby. It's my job to keep her up and running. Baby? You mean the animus? The plan is to go through the memories of his other ancestor, Ezio Auditore. This custom-made homebrewed animus is better than the one at Abstergo meaning its bleeding effect should be stronger. I suppose that's enough dicking around in the present. Let's head back to Ezio. Ooh, you play action complete. What do I win? Ah, that's right. Existential dread. Florence, Italy, year of 1476. The now 17-year-old Ezio is having a bit of a debate with this other kid, Vieri de Pazzi, voiced by Yuri Lowenthal. Oh yeah, also Ezio's voiced by Roger Craig Smith. Their family seem to be in some kind of feud. Things get heated and fighting breaks out. In this game, you can now counter when unarmed. As it was before, it's an instant KO. That's not the best start for the combat. But on the plus side, when you grab people now, you could hold onto them to get some extra hits in. After knocking a few heads with the help of your brother Federico, Fieri flees. Another new mechanic is introduced here, looting. 
It's rare that you get a significant amount of money from them, but it accumulates. And, oh yeah, speaking of which, money, shops. Everything in the first game was given to you over time, but now you have to earn things like getting healed or medicine, which didn't exist in the first game anyway, but still. And other things later on, like weapons and armor. After climbing up to a viewpoint with your dear brother, we get our title card. It is a good life we lead, brother. <sighs> the best. May it never change. And may it never change us. Nothing more subtle than that, boys and girls. Next up on Ezio's to-do list, his girlfriend, Christina. But first, posing for a fusion dance with no partner. After unsealing her door to darkness using his keyblade, Ezio's chased out by your father, who calls the guards on you. Here is where you're reintroduced to the chasing. It's a lot better. There are now arrows indicating where the enemies are. If they're red, they have you in their sights. If they're yellow, it means they're on the right track. And if they're gray, it means they're searching for you. From there, you can remain out of their sight until they give up or go into a hiding spot to make it go faster. On top of that, there's a GTA-esque circle on the radar that shows where you're most likely to be seen. After this, you go to your father, Giovanni, who's pretty cool with the whole street fight. But now's not the time. We need to get some work done for the family. Firstly, your mother needs help carrying some stuff for this young artist named Leonardo da Vinci. I'm not content merely to capture the world. I want to change it. Oh, Leonardo, I have no doubt you'll go on to do great things. Shh, comedic and ironic retort about how that's unlikely. <laughs> Next up, his younger brother, Petruccio. He wants some feathers. What for is a secret. So we head up to the roof and gather a few feathers, no problem. Your sister Claudia's boyfriend has been unfaithful. I loved him. No, Claudia. You only thought you did. He should suffer for what he's done. All right, fucking Christ, that was a quick shift. His name is Duccio, and he's very cool. You broke her heart. Ha! <laughs> And now I'm going to break your face. Break his face, and he yields. Lastly, Giovanni wants you to deliver some letters for these shady-looking people. Look to be thieves, prostitutes, and this guy that seems awfully nervous about being seen. After getting done with that, you're told to get home. But hey, some side missions. Yes, now you can do side jobs for money, including but not limited to delivering packages, beating up unfaithful husbands as we just did with that Duccio fella, and racing. They're nothing particularly special, but most certainly better than not having anything or the entire game revolving around them. Getting back home, things seem to have gone to shit real quick. Giovanni and your two brothers have been arrested. He tells them and the housemate to go find somewhere to hide, and he'll find out what happened to get them arrested. And then you climb up the prison building to find them. Giovanni seems to have known that this would happen eventually. He instructs Ezio to use his newly awakened eagle vision to find a secret door in their house and deliver a letter that he finds in there to his dear friend Uberto Alberti, as well as donning the outfit inside. Ezio finds the letter and the outfit, and he puts it on. Seems Giovanni was an assassin all along. We deliver the letter to Oberto as instructed. He assures him that he'll clear up everything for them. According to the letter, there's been a conspiracy against the Auditori family, and with his position as a judge, he can clear their name. Y you know, that is, unless he's part of the conspiracy. Hang him, boys! Uh, we will! Father! Uberto and this other hooded figure yell to have Ezio killed there as well, but he's too quick. There are too many to fight, but not too many to run from. Well, this is an unfortunate turn of events. Luckily, his mother and sister are safe at the local brothel, you know, the classic hideout spot. For now, Ezio's goal is to kill Uberto for betraying him and his family. But first, the owner of this establishment, Paola, will teach you how to hide while moving. Ezio's the most wanted man in the city, so the guards are quick to notice him. Paola teaches him that if he walks in crowds of people, he'll blend right in. It becomes as good of a hiding spot as a hay bale. Benches work as well, but they're not quite as useful. I'm really into this addition. It adds a lot to stealth. She also teaches him how to pickpocket. Holding A lets you walk a bit faster, and if you fast walk into someone, you steal from them. If you stay near the person you stole from, they might try to attack you. So if you're trying to be stealthy, fast walking everywhere might not be the best idea, because you might piss someone off and draw attention to yourself. At first, I thought this was a design flaw, but thinking about it more, it might be intentional to make stealth a bit trickier. You need to move slowly to get around guards on the ground. As a plus, the loot players that constantly harass you fuck off when you pickpocket them. Now, we need a weapon. We have a hidden blade from where we got the robes, but it's broken. So I guess you could say the blade is always hidden now. What happened to the laugh track? Paola instructs us to go and see Leonardo da Vinci. He'll help get it back in working order. Ah, so he's a repairman now. We make our way to him and he finds out that there was an entire scroll hidden inside of it. It's encrypted, can't be read by the average person, but Leonardo's no average guy. He decrypts it, revealing the original blueprint of the blade, letting him reconstruct it. Now all that's left is to cut Ezio's ring finger to make him compatible. 
<laughs> I was only having fun, Ezio. Though the blade once required a sacrifice, it's been modified. You can keep your finger. Ah, so we moved past that over time. Wait, then why was Lucy's finger cut off? Did they regress again? Well, quick spoiler, but Desmond gets one later on. No finger cutting required. What an idiot. Did you read a guide on making hidden blades from, like, the 12th century? Must have, must have cut your brain out, too. Oh, that was fun. What was I doing again? Right, avenging my family. But, uh, hold on. What is this marking? Using eagle vision to look at it, we see... Hello. This is... Uh, they, they, they call me Subject 16. Listen, I don't have much time. There's something I have to show you. We have been lied to this whole time. Everything we know, everything we've been brought up to believe, it's wrong. Find it. Find them all. And along the way, you'll begin to see the truth. What the heck? So, this is Subject 16. Someone who was put into the Animus for long periods of time, making him go insane. But at the same time, he was able to hack into the Animus when Abstergo wasn't looking. Doing that, he found a bunch of secrets about history itself, and he hid them all around to be found or seen by whoever was next in line. In this case, Desmond. He did that before offing himself in his room and putting messages in his blood all over the dang place. We're basically doing a bunch of puzzle minigames that totally undermine a bunch of historical events by making them all about the pieces of Eden. Gandhi helped bring independence to India thanks to the apple, of course. Some of them are really easy, some of them are annoying and tedious, but I suppose it doesn't matter for now. When you beat one, you get a small piece of footage, seconds long. If we find all markings like this and beat the puzzles, we'll be able to see the full video piece together. But, anywho, back to business. According to Paolo, Berto's gonna be attending an art show tonight. That's all Ezio needs to hear. Using the crowd trick we were taught, we get ourselves to a point where we can scale the building and look down to find him. Well, well. Uberto. He's having some conversations with the citizens. Talking about how the auditory were evil, they deserved to die, he's the greatest, a saint if there ever was one, blah blah blah. Once we get down there, however, he isn't gonna look so great. You! Ezio has himself a little fit and gets chased by the guards. After escaping, we can see that Oberto had a letter on him that we took. It tries to humanize him by making it seem like he did all of this for his wife and child. The Templars offered him money and a home in exchange for betraying his friend. He did it because they were broke. Apparently the head honchos in Florence, the Medici family, dealt him a bad hand, limited his flow of income severely. I can't really bring myself to care though. He did all of this in a very mustache twirling, oh I'm such a good guy to you main character until I'm not kind of way. Now we need to get the guards off your ass so we can leave Florence quietly with your mother and sister. Yet another new mechanic is introduced here, notoriety. There's a meter at the top left next to your health bar. The higher it is, the more the guards will notice you. Right now it's full, but if we tear a wanted poster down, it drops 25%. Nitpick, but there are some posters that are in places that no regular person will see. Like. Why up here? I get it's to make it a bit out of your way, but it just distracts me every time I see one. You could also bribe heralds that are cursing your name to stop talking about you, which will get the meter to go down 50%. Although it costs 500 florins, so you might as well just tear two posters. Or you can kill officials who lie about crimes you didn't commit for clout. Doing this makes it go down 75%. A cool detail about this system is that when you reach max notoriety, the music changes from its normal calm theme to a more tense one, giving you that feeling that you're on very thin ice. It's a neat little mechanic. Another improvement from the first game. So, we got that taken care of, now we need to leave. Where is father? And Federico? And Bertuccio? Ah, uh, just hanging around in the town square. Apparently they have an uncle Mario who can give them a place to stay in Monte Regioni. Uh oh, a wall of guards. It would be a pain to take on this many with only a hidden blade. And plus, I have to make sure this dead weight doesn't die even more. They can't climb either. Oh, I know. I'll hire some of the courtesans to distract them while we slip through. Like in the versatility game, keep it up and I may let you stay up past 10. And so, what remains of the Auditore family leave Florence. And that concludes our first chapter. That was a really good start. Introducing a flurry of new mechanics while improving on old ones. Not to mention the characters are 10 times more memorable. Can you name me three characters from the first game that aren't Altair, Almulim, or Malik? Shut up, no you can't. Ezio is a way 
way better protagonist than Altair. He smiles, he laughs, he yells out of anger, he has charisma and wit, but he's still young and naive to the world around him at the same time. That's a far cry from Broody McDemption arc over here. And the best part is, we're only at service level. So, we've made it to Monteregioni, a quaint little place. But before we can make it to the gate, we're gated off by an old friend. Fieri to Pazzi, up past bedtime I see. Let's drop some backstory real quick. The breadwinner of the Pazzi family, Francesco, was a banker, but not a very successful one. The ruling family of Florence, the Medici, overshadowed the fuck out of him, much like they did to Oberto. The Templars came and offered him a deal, that being they would provide him with a stable income and fame all around Florence. In exchange, he would kill the Medici. This was a good deal for him because he wanted to do that anyway. Giovanni caught wind of the Templar plot, and using his sway with the Medici, had Francesco thrown in prison. Vieri wasn't exactly pleased with this, and that's why the family's refuting. Now that Roberto has taken care of the situation, Francesco was released and back to his schemes. Problem is, Fieri isn't satisfied with just half of the Auditori family, so he's here to finish the job. Good thing, though, that we're not alone. Here comes Mario Auditori and his boys to give you a helping hand, as well as a helping sword. And so Vieri flees, and we take everyone else out. Keep the sword, Ezio. Do I know you from somewhere? Don't you recognize me? It's a me, Mario! Did you know? This line is a reference to Super Mario 64. Nice place you have here, Uncle. Except, it isn't really, but that's neither here nor there. While we came here looking for a way out of Florence, Mario sees it differently. He wants to train Ezio to become skilled in battle so that he may get revenge. While Ezio just wants to leave, he did have trouble fighting Vieri's men before the others came to help, so it would be beneficial to learn how to use a blade. While training, we can see enemies have health bars now, meaning counters aren't always an instant kill this time. Only like 80% of the time. I'll get into details later. For now, Mario drops some bombs on Ezio during battle. Uh, uh, not, not literally. Mainly confirming that Giovanni was indeed an assassin, and Uberto, the Pazzi, and the Man in the Hood are all Templars. He figures this information would be good enough to sway Ezio on the revenge path, but he still plans to leave with his mother and sister. However, once he learns that Vieri has been harassing the villa ever since he got here, he feels guilty at not helping and sets out to Tuscany to assist on their mission. The goal? to kill the Pazzi. Here's the plan. Mario and his boys will distract the guards at the front gate while Ezio sneaks in and opens the place up. From there, we'll press through, killing any guard in our way until we get to our target. There's a pretty large group of them in the center, so Mario and the others will have to deal with them while we find the Pazzi. And there they are. Vieri, his father Farqua uh, Francesco, and the eldest, Jacopo. And that hooded man is there as well. He's known as the Spaniard. The others follow his orders, so I guess we found the leader. But we'll have to take this one step at a time and aim for Vieri first. While the other Pazzi have left, he remains to fight. So now's your chance to get to him. If he's supposed to be a boss, consider me unimpressed. He's just a regular enemy with more health. And once just half of it is gone, you can finish him with a counter. Good to see that they haven't learned how to make a boss battle since the first game. I have the la fine che meritavi! Spero che bro! Enough, Ezio! Show some respect. Respect? After all that's happened... Do you think he would have shown either of us such kindness? You are not Fieri. Do not become him. Che la morte ti dia le pace che cercavi. Requiesca in pace. And so, we learned a valuable lesson today. Don't be mean. That's one name crossed off the list. Now we need to go for the other two Pazzi. But let's unwind a bit back at the villa for now. Perfect time for some more exposition, eh Mario? This wall has some like stupid pieces of paper placed on it. They're called Codex Pages. That scroll that Leonardo decoded for us was one of them. Legend has it that Altair himself wrote them. Using the apple's power, he was able to learn a great many things. Things like crafting a hidden blade without cutting the finger for basics. But on top of that, they all seem to have part of a map on there only visible with eagle vision. So collecting all of the Codex pages will lead to something Altair wanted the future assassins to find. So we ought to get them all. Good thing that there are four put in mildly inconspicuous chests in the villa. How long have you lived here? The place isn't that big, you can't have not seen this. Either way, it's not nearly enough. Speaking of collectibles and Altair, heading down the secret bookcase dungeon, we have a statue of seven assassins from generations past, including the big man himself at the center. Another thing Altair learned from the 
Apple was how to craft the perfect armor, strong and light at the same time. Problem is, it's gated off. We need to collect six seals from hidden tombs littered throughout Italy and put them in place of other statues. Only then will the armor be within our grasp. Speaking again of collectibles, Mother Auditore hasn't spoken a word since her husband and sons went bye-bye. All she does is sit at her bedside and pray. Maybe if she does it enough, they'll come back. But, uh, hey, look at that! A box! Your late brother Petruccio collected feathers, yes? Maybe if we collect a hundred of them to honor his memory, the lady might budge. That is a big stretch, but fuck it, I got time if you do. And as for the villa itself, yes, I know, we're almost done. As I've said, the place isn't in tip-top shape. There are run-down, abandoned buildings, barely any shops open, and few people. So we can raise the money to bring it to a much more presentable state. The more we build up, the more passive income we can make. Now that we've gotten all that stuff out of the way, let's get on with the mission. Two years later. Yeah. No joke. It apparently took that long to hear about any Templar movement, and that movement was back in our hometown of Florence. Let's go talk to our boy Leonardo first. Now that I've got some more codex pages for him, he can decipher it and maybe make us some new equipment. As it turns out, it's not just that this time. There's some new techniques written on there as well. Firstly, we can assassinate someone from a hay bale and drag them in to hide the body. Next, you can grab someone from a ledge and drag them off. And finally, a classic. Leap from a high place to pin someone onto the ground and let the hidden blade do the rest. You know, honestly, when I played the first game, I was surprised that these moves weren't in there. They're mainstays at this point. The Leap Assassination is like Sonic Spin Dash, but hey, that wasn't introduced until Sonic 2 either. As for the new equipment, a second hidden blade. So now you can kill two at once. Don't know why I took Altair the Apple of Eden to figure out that you can use two, but whatever. Next up, uh oh, someone stole money from us. Ouch, oh, my money! Your money. I don't have your money! <laughs> ah, okay. Thanks for helping me narrow it down, though. The chase was actually leading us to the thief leader, La Volpe, otherwise known as the Tasty Treat. Alright, uh, that was a lie, it's the fox. He wanted to tell you about a secret Templar meeting going on in this big old building. We can't just waltz in, so he guides us to the secret entrance that can lead us right to them. Not much of note happens here, so I'll cut to once we get to eavesdropping distance of their parent-teacher conference. You know, except the child is dead. But it seems Francesco took that whole thing pretty well. His son was kind of a bitch, so I can't blame him. Plus, it has been two years. Their plan is as we suspected. They're gonna kill the Medici family tomorrow during Sunday service. All we needed to hear, really, let's head out. Oh, but what's this? A sarcophagus. And what do you know, it's one of the seal keys to Altair's armor. So I guess we're in one of those tombs Mario mentioned. That means we only got five to go. Good thing the rest are marked on the map now. How convenient that Ezio historically knew exactly where to go. Either way, we haven't seen every map yet, so we can't just go to them all right away. For now, let's rest up so we can protect the Medici in the morning. Or, I can tell you a little more about the gameplay. The combat, firstly. It's received an upgrade from our last adventure, mainly with the enemies. There are now different enemy classes. The standard goons, more armored variants that can't be killed by a counter until their health is low, knife-wielding ones that are easy to kill but more difficult to run away from, heavily armored ones which deal large damage but are easy to dodge and punish, and finally, guards with spears. You can't counter them with anything except the hidden blade in your fists. When you use your fist to counter, you disarm the enemy and can use their weapons. Unless you're fighting the armored ones, in which case it takes a bit of coaxing. If you press the attack button immediately after disarming someone, you instantly kill them no matter who it is. Speaking of which, you're no longer restricted to just a sword and knife. You can take a mace, an axe, a spear, or my favorite, a broom. It behaves like it's a blunt instrument. It deflects attacks from actual warhammers. You whack people over the head with it and they die. You can slit people's throats with it. If you don't find that funny, you're a serial killer. And then there are the shops. I've brought up being able to buy weapons and armor, but on top of that, blacksmiths can also repair armor that's been broken. You can break it by getting hit too much or taking too much fall damage. There are also doctors you can buy medicine from, or poison that you can coat your hidden blade with. It makes whoever you prick go berserk before succumbing to the toxin. And lastly, we have tailors. Depending on your area, you can have your robes dyed in a variety of different colors. I went with red for a little while, but I changed it up over time, you'll see. And now we move on to the climbing. So, in the previous video, I mentioned that the climbing in AC1 was janky and slow. I received a few comments refuting this, which showed me that I could have been a little more specific with what I meant. When I said the climbing was slow in AC1, I meant just the climbing. The parkour is a fine speed, and I get that you're supposed to combine the two to traverse the world as fast as possible. Horizontal movement is just as important as vertical. 
But when it does come time to start going purely vertical, which is going to happen quite a few times, that's when it gets sluggish in my opinion. And that comes down entirely to the fact that Altair does tiny leaps at a time for each particular piece of wall. Moving over to the second game, however, Best Boy Ezio will go at a much faster speed. You see this difference, Altair? This is what happens when you have more than one woman in your time period. There's still some jank here and there, but there's definitely a noticeable improvement from the first game. All that being said, I did make some mistakes. The biggest in my eyes was when I talked about how many times I got flung off walls. Little did I know that that was due to my own error. You see, in these games, or at least the early ones, there are two states that our dashing MC can be in. Low profile, meaning you're walking around, minding your own business, maybe giving thanks to the big man upstairs, or high profile, meaning when you're running, mainly. Now, what's important to note is that to go into high profile, you have to hold RT or its equivalents on other controllers or keyboards. Some actions, such as assassinations, change when holding that down. Now, when you're running, you can hold the A button or its equivalents to boost it into a sprint. And to climb up a wall, you have to be sprinting. While climbing, holding RT lets you go a bit faster, and the A button lets you jump off the wall in whatever direction you're holding. All of this I knew. I didn't go in depth on it because I thought it wasn't worth it. But here's where I messed up. On foot, you can do a little leap from running if you double tap A. So when I would jump off the wall, I would also double tap A there. But as it turns out, you only need to press it once here or hold it. And whenever I was climbing in these games, I might have indeed been holding A. I mean, can you blame me? You have to hold those two buttons to start climbing, so naturally I felt I should hold on to them to climb faster, even though all I needed to do was hold RT. So in a few instances, I would hold the stick in a weird direction because the way my camera was positioned, and the game would think, oh, he wants to jump. And that's why I would get flung off walls. It was entirely my fault. I do still remember one or two times when I got flung off the wall despite not holding A, but I'm either misremembering or these were very rare instances, so I'll give him a pass. Moving back to the combat for a second, another thing I neglected to mention in the video was combo killing. It was something that could make it go a bit faster. What you have to do is swing at your opponent, and the moment your sword made contact with his, press the attack button again to land an immediate killing blow. I don't think it completely changes the flow of combat, or even to the point that it changes my view of it, but it's large enough that I feel bad not bringing it up. There were some minor things that I didn't notice and or mention, but I don't want to dwell on this for too long. What I will say is that I still overall maintain my position on AC1. Some of the comments I got really loved the game, calling some aspects perfect. And you know what? More power to them. But it's still very okay in my eyes. And while these corrections might have bumped the game up a bit, the fact that the game itself did a terrible job at bringing these things to my attention knocked it back down some. We'll just have to agree to disagree. All right, it's time to praise the Lord and protect the Medici. Where is Francesco? There he is. I'm to strike. No, no, hold on, Ezio. They'll escape if I strike too early. Give it a moment. It. Ah! Any second. If there's one thing you need to learn as an assassin, it's patience. They saw not the God! Francesco! Mori! 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 Ugh, all right, fine, let's go. This fight is not dissimilar to Vieri's, but this time we're also protecting Lorenzo de' Medici. We have some help from their personal guard, too. Eventually, Francesco flees, so we're just left to clean up from there. Unfortunately, despite our best efforts, Lorenzo's brother Giuliano didn't survive. And now the entire town is a battleground between the Templars and the Medici. We've got to end this now. Francesco's at the Palazzo, so that is where he'll be hanged. Francesco. See? And that ends the Posse bloodline. Oh yeah, I forgot about Jacopo! <sighs> Can't chase more than one person a day, can we? I suppose we'll have to get him later. While we wait to hear any info on him, we'll do some more side stuff. Assassination contracts, specifically. It's pretty simple, you just have to take out a person or people of your contractor's choosing. Usually there are win conditions like doing it without being caught or under a time limit. These are a much better way of testing your abilities than the minigame shit from AC1. Because firstly, they're optional, so you're not forced to deal with it constantly, you could do it on your own time. And also, they're usually more challenging. You have to pick your target out from a crowd instead of them just being marked on the map. 
and so you have to actually use Eagle Vision. It was trash last time, and now it's very useful. Your targets in these contracts and in the main game are highlighted for you when in this mode. Much like with a certain other game I'm currently playing, you're encouraged to think outside the box when it comes to these. Take this first one, for instance. You can't be detected by your target, and he's guarded on both sides. So, using my noggin, I toss some money right in front of the guards so the pedestrians will all crowd together picking it up. And while they're busy getting the peasants to fuck off, I can swoosh my way in and kill the target before he can call for help. I mean, I was caught right after, but a win is a win. For this contract with the same win condition, he was being guarded by a spear guy, so I hired some thieves as I did with the courtesans earlier. I had them steal from the guard and that got him to not chase after them. Okay, that would usually work, but people got distracted by that display anyway, which let me go in for the kill. The point I'm trying to make is that these are pretty cool, wow. Man, if only I were this articulate a year ago. Well, what have you got for me, what's your name? Jacopo skipped town before they had the chance to arrest him, and with him, he took his henchmen, the ones who helped with the attack yesterday. Jacopo can't be located, but we do get some useful information after we ask our uncle. He has four goons that escaped with him. They're all in the countryside, plotting and scheming. The first is preaching at the top of a tower where no one can hear him. One is found on the streets, mumbling with paranoia, which he is right to have. The next is being guarded by a small army, which we counter with our own, that one's pretty fun. And the last is guarded by monks. Dangerous monks. From their accumulated knowledge, we learn where Jacopo is. At church, who would have guessed? But if we follow him for a while before we put him down, he could lead us to his Templar friends. And thus begins the first tailing mission. I'm sure you've heard the animosity for this type of gameplay. And it's important to note that everyone that's complained about it is totally right, this sucks. AC2 so far has been very good, showing how far the series can be pushed in just one game. But these missions drag it down severely. The first one isn't too bad, but it's far from the last. For the most part, they go on for far too long, with one little mistake making you go back a few minutes, not helped by the fact that they usually walk at the pace of my videos. Thankfully, there are checkpoints, but I wouldn't say that that makes it any easier. And secondly, when they're too far, a counter starts going down, which means failure. Not too bad, right? Wrong, because I just lied to you. What actually happens if he's too far is instant failure. The counter starts when your target isn't in your vision, meaning it starts when he turns a corner, or even if you have the camera panned a little to the left. It doesn't matter if you're sniffing his ass. If your camera isn't looking at him, the game wants you to know it. This is not a test of my skills, this is a test of my patience. Anyway, Jacopo led us to these... ruins, I want to call them? Where he meets up with the Spaniard, who's not happy with him at all. He, his son, and his grandson all failed to bring us and the Medici down. The old man makes the big mistake of getting lippy, complaining about how they could have helped him. You make excuses and insult us? How do you expect me to respond? I don't know. The Spaniard knew I was here, which, I mean, I'm kind of standing out in the open, so fair. He leaves me to be killed as well. So if you release me, I will spare your lives. <laughs> Jacopo's still breathing, so it's our job to finish him off. Now that we've learned some manners from good old Mario, we give these objectively evil people the respect they deserve. <laughs> and so, that ends the Potsy. And thank Christ, I was getting sick of him. But at this point, it means nothing. The Spaniard is still out there with who knows how many more subordinates. I fear that Uberto and the Potsy were just the beginning. We bring the news of the Potsy's fate to Lorenzo. Two years later- what? Why did it take me so long? I know travel back then was longer, but not that much longer. The funniest part of that is the conversation is like five sentences in total. We then conclude that we need to go to Venice to track down the other Templars. As it turns out, Leonardo is also moving shop over there, so at least we have a road trip, buddy. Leonardo! Ezio? What the fuck? There's some shenanigans with Templar goons trying to take us down, but besides that, it's a very calm trip. We make our way to the ferry, but Ezio was never invited or given a pass, so he's not allowed on. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, look, a woman's stranded. Oh, look, we saved her. Oh, look, she's got sway with the people of the ferry. That's Caterina Sforza, daughter of the Duca di Milano. Her husband is... Husband? See, si. her husband is the Lord of Forli. That woman is as powerful and dangerous as she is young and beautiful. Sempre come una donna per me. Married? The gang decides to pull us out of the Animus for the day so our brains don't get fucked up. Going down to the garage, we can see that we have indeed gained some skills from good old Ezio. Look at us, climbing up walls, jumping across light ceiling shit, even climbing ladders. And the best part is, I'm only seeing visions from the past every 30 seconds. And while I'm at that, Desmond and Lucy chat about Subject 16. Ah, good old Subject 16. He repainted my room, you know. 
with his blood. Did you really have to spell that out? Through putting him into multiple different time periods, the Renaissance seemed to have been a point of interest for him, hence the markings and fun puzzles. That's part of the reason why we didn't just stick with Altair. There's something to find in this particular land of dysentery. Once we're done, we start heading back up, but our visions end up getting the best of us and we go out. What the hell? Oh. What is this? Couldn't leave well enough alone, could you? We meet up with this lady. Using process of elimination, we have to assume that this is the woman who was disguised as Robert. What was her name? Roberta? Something I appreciate is that in this flashback, Altair maintains the climbing speed he had in AC1, as opposed to Ezio's. Or maybe I'm doing it badly somehow, I don't know. I'm scared of being wrong now. I wonder what he wants with her. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, uh okay, I mean... I suppose I should have guessed. Whatever, we don't have to think about that for another two games. Let's get moving. Well, here we are in Venice. Immediately through taking a tour around the city, we can learn that it has issues of its own. Mainly the law is going around shaking down small businesses. I think I heard talk of opening a McDonald's. As a result, there's a big resistance against the man behind it all, Emilio Barbarico. Here come some of the rebels right now. Ah! Yeah, you see? Don't mess with police states. But because I'm a nice guy, I'll endure a shitty multi-stage escort mission just for you. Seriously, this mission sucks. First, you have to follow her halfway through town while she's limping and telling you that you're moving too slow. Then you have to carry her for the other half. Then you have to keep guard over the boat we just put her in, but don't deal with opposition too far away or else it's game over for you. At the very least, you can swim in this game, so you don't have to worry about making a wrong jump here. Fun fact, the manual for this game states that Altair actually was capable of swimming, but a bug in the animus was what made it an instant death. Rebecca went ahead and released a community patch for that. You can find it on Nexus Mods. But anyway, we got this lady proper medical attention. And as it turns out, this group of ruffians has heard about her exploits in Florence and wants to help us deal with Emilio. Can I offer you something? Biscotti. Un café. What's café? An interesting concoction brought to me by a Turk merchant. Here, have a taste. A little bitter, if you ask me. Just seems lacking somehow. I don't know, have you considered adding sugar, maybe? Or latte? Or maybe throwing it out, because it sucks. Oh, have another cup, you could sleep when you're dead. Well, why don't you just fucking die? <laughs> but first, they teach us a new climbing trick. By holding up on the stick and pressing A, you can do an extended jump upward to reach places you couldn't before. This is a great addition and makes the climbing way better than it used to be in my opinion. It's certainly gonna make traversal a lot easier. And speaking of which, now that we have all the major locations unlocked, it's time to talk about the visuals. In terms of the design of the cities and buildings, I'd say it's on par with the last game. It's clear that Ubisoft does their homework when it comes to recreating real-world places. It's lively as ever, and each location feels distinct. If I showed you a still from Florence and another from Venice, I'm sure someone who's played the game can tell you which is which. However, is it just me, or is the game a little worse than AC1 when it comes to lighting. Like, look at them side by side. Things look a bit more faded and washed out in two as opposed to one's more solid look. I'm sure it was intentional to give this game a different vibe from the last, but I think it went a bit overboard at points. Anyway, I think we've reached a point in the story where we can start speeding through some parts. We have to do some work for these fellas in order to get to Emilio. If you're wondering why we're going for him in the first place, it's because he was this guy in the cutscene with Jacopo. So, yeah, he's a Templar. We have to release some of their own that were kidnapped, deal with a few traitors, and retrieve a few disguises for our big plan later. Get off! Get back! Speaking of which, it's time to enact this plan. Emilio is in his palazzo, being heavily guarded. What we're gonna do is take out the archers surrounding the place so we don't have to worry about them later. I know better than to make that mistake again. And now we'll replace them with our freshly disguised friends. Emilio's guard is still patrolling its border. Use my men. They can distract the guards. Then we climb in using our new trick we were taught, and from there, he's easy pickings. Love it when a plan goes together like that. That was surprisingly fun. It sort of reminded me of how you deal with a target in Sly Cooper, where you have to assess the situation, set up a plan, and using our advantages and what we've learned, deal with a threat. This was a very well-structured chapter, but 
Emilio is far from Venice's only problem. In fact, we saw him with another Templar named Carlo Grimaldi before we took care of him. And luckily, Antonio, that's this guy's name by the way, knows where he's going. As it turns out, another Templar meeting is going down right in the middle of town. Through another lovely tailing mission, we learn of their intentions. He could be anywhere. He could be here right now, and we might not even know. <laughs> Shh, don't tell. They plan to assassinate the Duke of Venice and have one of their own claim his spot. They can't do that. Assassinating's my job. We have to stop them somehow, but their palazzo makes the one we just cleared look like- Hey, guys. I wanted to pause here for a second to warn you. This was the first time in my scripting career that I just couldn't think of a joke. I literally wrote in this part, in parentheses, come up with something funny. The problem is, I'm not the best at improv. So the best I could think of was to make a really lame dick joke. I want to apologize for what you're about to hear. I feel embarrassed. I feel depressed. I feel confused as to how I could fall this far. The best I can say is that I'm sorry. All right, roll it. Their palazzo makes the one we just cleared look like the average male penis. You know, it's perfectly normal. No matter what angle we look at it from, there's no way we can get in there in time. All potential entrances would either take too long, draw attention, or just be impossible to climb. If only there were a way to just sprout wings and fly in there, like a bird. Yes, if only I were a bird. Leonardo, make me a bird. What? No! Oh shit, that was fast. Nice set of wings you've made here. Using the laws of aerodynamics and the rising heat from fire to keep it boosted, we can, um, sneak our way into the palazzo. But unfortunately, even though we literally learned how to fly for this, it still wasn't enough to make it in time. Carlo poisoned his drink. You have failed, assassin. Forgive me, signore. I tried. <laughs> Don't worry, I poisoned him right back. Thanks to the Duke's poor wording before death, his murder was pinned on us. You... you killed me? You killed me?! Why is he bleeding? Now we're the most wanted in Venice, so we need to lie low for a while. And because this period of cover is five years, we can take some time to do more side stuff. How about getting a few codex pages? Although they're listed as simple collectibles, it's actually essential to the story that you get them all. Good thing for us that they're all marked on the map. They're always guarded, so you've gotta fight your way to them. Either that, or utilize one of your many distractions. Smoke bombs are always a fun one for me. And fortunately, the ones we decode teach us how to be more cool and have more health. Let's not forget the feathers either. As I said before, there are 100 to get. Even one less, and Mother Dearest won't give a shit. Mario shows his appreciation to us if we get half of them though, by having a special warhammer made for you. It's the second best weapon in the game, so if you like doing things halfway like a coward, maybe do this. Uh, hey guys, me again. I just thought of something. I could have said it makes the palazzo we just cleared look like the length of Assassin's Creed 1, and now I'm even sadder and disappointed in myself that I couldn't think of that. Sometimes life likes to throw challenges at you to test your strength, but I don't think I'm strong enough. Anyway, five years later, we're still on the FBI's most wanted. Jeez, you get accused of assassinating one monarch. We've still got plenty of Templars left to kill, but it's gonna be trickier than ever now. Good thing that the carnival is in town. Everyone around here wears a mask at this time of year. Leonardo's happy to lend us one to disguise ourselves, as well as a new upgrade for our hidden blade. A gun. For real. It's a little mechanism that lets you shoot bullets from your wrist. Man, Leonardo's a fucking bro. None of my friends would make me a wrist gun. Its wind-up time is pretty long, and it's extremely loud. So much so that whenever you fire, a dog barks in the distance. But man, is it useful. Before, all we had were throwing knives, and besides two enemy classes, they didn't kill in one shot. Now we have something genuinely viable here. Now, our target this time around is a man by the name of Marco Barbarigo. I've been skipping out on most of the villain backstories so far, because they haven't been all that relevant. But I wanted to highlight this one. So, Marco has this personal bodyguard, Dante Moro, right? You can see them both earlier on during that meeting. Marco's this guy, and Dante's that guy. He wasn't much of a talker. Now, the reason for that is because of brain damage. And how did that happen, you ask? Well, it wasn't always this way. Marco was eyeing Dante's wife. But he wasn't one for adultery, that's cringe. So he had someone stab Dante in the head, which did not kill him. It just reverted him to the mental state of a child. And taking advantage of this, Marco has Dante signed divorce papers so his now ex-wife is single, ready to mingle. And now Marco has both of them, all to himself. 
That is so fucked. Oh, and by the way, he's also the new Duke after the last one was killed, so that presents a big problem. Luckily, he'll be making an appearance at the carnival, so if we attend, we could have the chance to assassinate the Duke for real this time. We've been instructed to get instructions from the brothel. What? We've been getting help from weird places all game. This isn't even the first brothel. Anyway, this lady, Theodora, says he'll be showing himself in an exclusive part of the carnival. In order to get in, we need a special golden mask. The one we have just won't do. But we can win one in a competition. There are four games we have to win. One is to pickpocket ribbons from these ladies, the next is to win a race, the next is a game of capture the flag, and the last, a test of strength. Multiple rounds of fisticuffs, the last round being against poor Dante himself. But then the announcer is bribed and allows armed guards to enter the fray, but the power of RT and X are not to be underestimated. But if the Templars can bribe that, then they can bribe themselves the Golden Mask, making our efforts pointless. And that was like 20 minutes of work too. But don't worry, because we can just pickpocket it from Dante, getting us our hard-earned mask. Although, now that I think about it, would a mask really disguise us that well? I figure they know us less for our face and more for our attire. Despite the vibe we go after, we kind of stick out. Nitpicking, I know. We made it right on time for Marco's speech, but Dante caught on to our tricks and now they're searching for us. So we have to stay out of sight for one minute. The games relied on stealth a lot more than the first game already, but this part in specific is the first one I'd really call tense. This space is pretty small and there are a fair amount of guards. You have courtesans to hide yourself, but two get automatically taken away when you're close to a guard. You have to remain distance and not stick out on full notoriety. I like it. And another thing, I appreciate them dressing up Venice for the carnival just for this part of the story. With extra crowds and performers and whatnot, they probably could have gotten away with just pretending all that stuff was there, but they want the extra mile. Now we have an opening. Time to take out Marco. We have to use the gun so we don't get caught. There are fireworks in the sky, so the sound of a gunshot will blend right in. Pretty smart plan, even though it didn't work at all. Well, we can consider Venice monarch free for the night. Let's celebrate a job well done by fucking a prostitute. Marco Barbarago may be done for, but his brother Silvio still lurks. In fact, he still has the city guard at his disposal. We're gonna need to have our own army in order to get to him. Antonio advises we go to Bartolomeo de Alviano, head of the mercenaries in town. It seems Silvio figured we'd try that, however, so he launched an attack on them and had Bartolomeo imprisoned. Although not for long because, I mean, come on, look at me. Now we fight together. Us with our trusty warhammer, him with the blessed broom. Although it seems that it's not his weapon of choice, unfortunately. His real one is his sword, Bianca. Aww, he named it, that's cute. If only you and Rebecca were in the same time period, you'd be made for each other, you fucking freaks. So our goal for now is to free as many mercenaries as we can to use against Silvio's men. Then we dispatch them throughout the city and have the guards scrambling to beat them, which gives us the perfect opening to slip into Silvio's personal space. He and Dante try to get to the boat headed to anywhere but Hearsville, but I'm the quickest blade around. Dante was going to give us some extra information on where they were fleeing, but he bled out before he could. Probably for the best that someone put him out of his misery. Well, that takes care of all the Templar big boys. All that's left is the Spaniard, also known by his true name, Rodrigo Borgia. You know the drill, two years pass. It's now been over 10 years since the Auditori family was cut in half. And now, finally, they may be avenged. You see, the boat that was gonna take Silvio and Dante away is coming back, meaning Mr. Borgia could be on it. On top of that, Leonardo's taken a closer look at the Codex pages and deciphered a hidden message among them, beyond the map we already established. It states that a prophet will appear when two pieces of Eden come together in Venice, and he will open a vault. The Templars have spent the past two years in Cyprus searching for one of the pieces, and based on the ship coming back soon, it's probably been found. Oh, so that's why XOF stormed the hospital. They weren't looking for Big Boss, they were looking for weapons of mass destruction. This joke is fucking stupid. If they found the two that they were looking for, they have to be stopped before they can open this vault, whatever may be in there. The following day, we're there to see the boat arrive. They hand off the piece of Eden to this guard, and here we go with yet another tailing mission. This one is especially annoying because the guard is one of the speedy types, so you basically have to be running the whole time while staying out of trouble. Except for those random times where you just turns around to fuck you over, of course. And if you get caught by any of the guards, you now have to deal with them while not drawing attention from the asshole, and not taking too long so he doesn't get too far. I really dislike this type of mission. Anyway, he drops it off, giving us the opportunity to snatch it and go. 
but we overhear that Rodrigo Borgia himself will be collecting it personally. We can't pass up a two-for-one deal, can we? So instead, we disguise ourselves as one of the guards and play the role of delivery boy. This is a big moment, so we have a nice long walk to collect our thoughts, soaking in everything that's happened so far. That flying thing was pretty weird, wasn't it? Well, here he is. And here I am. So, where is he? Who? The final boss. All I see is a wimp. Also the Prophet, what was the deal with that? Don't you see him? The Prophet is already here. It's that guy! Well, I guess this is it. Just a regular old sword fight. Nothing special. Also, Rodrigo makes very weird sounds when he's countered. <laughs> Eventually, though, he calls in backup. This isn't good. At this rate, I'm toast. My vision slowly fades as I slowly accept my defeat. But then, I guess you could say, a miracle happened. Don't worry, Nepote. You are not alone. Our own cavalry arrives. Wow, all of my friends are here. Antonio, Bartolomeo, Uncle Mario, and even, uh, H Henry. With their help, we can cross Rodrigo. No the entire Templar army. Come on, gang. Let's put an end to this evil. This is for my father. Really? Even more old faces appear, along with one new one. This guy is Niccolo Machiavelli, and he drops a few truth bombs on us. Firstly, it's very probable that Ezio is the prophet that was foretold. We are the main character, so that would add up. And secondly, not only is this guy an assassin, but so was everyone else here. They've all been guiding us the entire time to make us the best darned assassin in Italy. And that is exactly what we've become. And now, we can fully be made one of them. Luckily, Rodrigo ran off without grabbing the piece of Eden, so it's all ours. And what do you know? It's the apple. Long time no see, old friend. But remember, the pages said that there were supposed to be two. We have no idea where the second one is, while the Templars probably do. We're at a stalemate, and it's up to us to turn it into a checkmate. We're at the final stretch of the game, so it's our last chance to get any side stuff done. The biggest one in my eyes is the remaining five tombs. As I said, they're all out in the open. I could have gotten to all of them a while ago, but I wanted to save it until now. The first few are nothing to note, really. Just some small labyrinth with maybe an enemy or two sprinkled around. But the last two are notable for having some genuinely challenging parkour and climbing sections. They time you and make you think on your toes. And now that I've collected every seal, it's time to open up that gate and see what Altair was cooking. He wasn't lying. It's definitely the strongest armor in the game. Sturdy and light. On top of that, it can't be broken, so there's no need to ever get it repaired. It also came with a new set of black robes with striped sleeves. I dig it. And finally, our gracious ancestor gave us his signature sword, which, like the armor, is the best you can get. Well done, Altair. I'm cool as fuck now. I've also raised Monteregione up to 100%. I've restored all the old buildings and received a boost in population. Now you can go to church and say a prayer and then follow that up with getting a woman to touch you in funny places. I'd say this is the best place in all of Europe now. And lastly, I've collected the rest of the feathers, which finally let Petruccio rest in peace or something. At the very least, it helped Mother Auditori come to terms with the other's deaths. And what do we get for getting a hundred collectibles? Well, I'll give you a hint, it's pretty effective at its job. If you guessed that it raised your notoriety to full anywhere you go with no means to lower it, you'd be correct. What a fucking bonus. Seriously, that's such a slap in the face. The cutscene we got was like 10 seconds, and the reward was basically hard mode for what is most likely going to be after you've beaten the game. So, hard mode for free roam. I played the mission where you get that disguise with the cape on, and it was a nightmare. Left and right I was getting spotted, and it was an instant failure. It may be canon that you do, but don't get the feathers. Was there anything else? Well, there's two DLC chapters for what happens in between this and the final mission. But as I stated back in the first video, I only plan on talking about DLC that I deem worthy. These aren't really, but they do fill a pretty large gap, so I'll briefly summarize them. Basically, while we wait to hear any news about Rodrigo's whereabouts, we need to hide the apple somewhere the Templars wouldn't think to look. Mario suggests Forli, a place that was in the main game, but we were in it for all of two seconds to get on the boat to Venice. We go there and meet up with Katarina Sforza, the lady who we saved from the dangers of water earlier. But it seems she has problems of her own. These two, the Orsi brothers, were hired by Rodrigo to steal the apple from us, so they kidnapped two of Katarina's children for ransom. But through some funny shenanigans, we get both of them back, as well as kill one of the... Uh, let's say kill one of the children. <laughs> 
<laughs> as well as kill one of the brothers. But it was a trap! You see, while the skilled assassin was busy rescuing some worthless children, the second brother took the opportunity to snatch the apple right from Katarina's hands. We catch and eventually kill him, but he managed to get a cheap shot on us while we were doing our whole animus death thing. I'm surprised he was the first to do that. And while our consciousness fades from the injury, an unknown man grabs the apple. We wake up and we have a beard now, goodbye. DLC 2 has us back in Florence. Turns out the guy who stole the apple, Savonarola, wasn't a Templar. He's just a nut job who seeks to erase all knowledge and presumably start humanity over from scratch. So he's turned the whole city into a massive cult using the apple's power. There's burnings left and right, not just of books, but of paintings and all other forms of knowledge as well. And Rodrigo's men are at war with Savonarola's. Our hometown is a mess. We deal with all nine of his lieutenants, which took me a whole hour by the way, which made the people start to wake up and push against his rule, forcing the man himself to come out. He's about to use the apple, but we throw a pebble or something to make him drop it. Someone else grabs it, but we don't let this one get away. Savonarola gets burned at the stake, but we make his suffering quicker and just stab him. Assassins don't roll like that. Ezio gives a motivational speech to the people of Florence, and it's done. We don't need anyone to tell us what to do. Not Savonarola, not the Medici. We are free to follow our own path. Show us that dick. Now, back to the main plot. As you should have expected, here comes another time skip. Except this time, it's by a whole 11 years. Ezio's in his 40s now. Except the only noticeable difference is that beard. And everyone else looks exactly the same. Life expectancy back then was 30 to 40, but I guess assassins are just built different. Oh, and by the way, Rodrigo's been busy himself. He only went ahead and made himself the fucking Pope. Turns out Rodrigo Borgia's a real person who was actually Pope. I suppose that makes sense, but making the Bishop of Rome a Templar leader is such a shark jump to me. Next you're gonna tell me that all of a sudden there's a Kraken in the game that doesn't have any sound effects. What the fuck? Anyway, as I've stated before, collecting all the codex pages was essential to the story. So I did just that. And putting all the pages together forms a map of the world, with North and South America as well, which wasn't known at the time. And it seems to show that this vault that the prophecy spoke about is in Rome, which explains why Rodrigo's taken such a <laughs> liking to the place. The papal staff is the second piece of Eden that they needed, meaning all we need to do is go there and rip the staff from his hands, and we'd have everything we need to open the vault for ourselves. It's time for us to pay a visit to the Vatican. This is the final part of the game, and as a final part should, it puts all your skills to the test. The climbing, the combat, the stealth, it even has a fun horse part. I didn't bring up the horse riding in this game because it was nearly non-existent, but hey, it's here. And once you've reached the end, there he is, in all of his majesty. Although, I'd say he'd look a little more majestic like this. I thought... I thought I was beyond this, but I'm not. I've waited too long, lost too much. Requiescat in pace, you bastard. I don't think so. But there's no doubt he was prepared for this. With the papal staff, he can resist a simple assassination attempt like that. It's a nice piece of Eden you got there. Wanna see mine? Here's a neat trick I learned from Al Nualim, an army of me. Anyone's worst nightmare. For real though, I appreciate him using that move. It's a cool callback, and nice for me to use it on someone rather than the other way around. The fight isn't that special though, just a normal fight against a special guy with a lot of health. But cutscene villains, as they always do, win. He overpowers us and takes the apple before giving us our second stab in the gut. I guess he just expects us to bleed out because he goes to the vault right away without finishing the job. He didn't even stab us good. We're walking just fine with most of our health. Imagine having this grand plan for over 20 years and when you're finally at the cusp of achieving what you aimed for, you get lazy and don't want to kill the last person in your way. Well, here I am. Looks like you're having some trouble opening that vault, even with both pieces of Eden and a cutscene power boost. You must really suck. It's over, Rodrigo. No more tricks. No more ancient artifacts. No more weapons. Let us see what you are made of, old man. All right then. If that's how you want to play it. So the final battle begins. Most people seem to hate this part. The last final boss was pretty solid, all things considered, putting a twist on the combat and keeping you on your toes at all times. But this is just a fist fight, scripted to last as long as their dialogue does. But honestly, 
I dig it. I mean, come on. You're having a fist fight with the Pope while he gives a speech about how he doesn't give a fuck about actually being an icon to people. He just wants power and to kill God. Whatever lies beyond that wall won't be able to resist the staff and anvil. They were made from very gods. God is meant to be all-knowing, all-powerful. You think a couple of ancient relics can harm him? <laughs> Are you so naive? I became Pope because it gave me access. It gave me power. You think I believe a single goddamn word of that ridiculous book? It's so fucking stupid and I like it for that exact reason. But eventually, you whittle his health to a low point and finally take Rodrigo Borgia down. It's my destiny! Mine! I am the prophet! You never were. Get it over with, then. No. Killing you won't bring my family back. What? I'm done. Requiescat in pace. What? Are you kidding me? The man just talked about killing God after successfully managing to get in a position of extreme power and status in order to do it, and he's the one you won't kill? Do you know how much of a pain in the ass he can potentially be moving forward? Man, imagine having this grand plan for over 20 years and when you're finally at the cusp of achieving what you aimed for, you get lazy and don't want to kill the last person in your way. Well, the vault opens for us because we were the real prophet. Let's see what goodies are inside. Greetings, Prophet. It is good you have come. Oh, there is a god in here. One of many, apparently. Actually, they aren't gods. They're just a different species that was far more advanced than us. Humanity just doesn't understand them. That's basically all the lore we get out of her, but there is a touch more to find. In the Subject 16 thingies. As I said before, if you do all of them, you can piece together a video. The video shows Adam and Eve running from... something. It's unclear as to what but the assumption can be made that it's from this other ancient species. They climb as well, better than your average assassin could. And while doing so, they spot other humans doing manual labor. At least, I think they're human. Eve shows us that she has the apple before the video cuts off. All I can tell from that is, if they were running from this other species, the humans were potentially the reason these ones died out. This one, Minerva, speaks in the past tense when referring to her kind. Maybe I'm off the mark, but that's what I've gathered so far. Anyway, she's here to give us a warning. There are other temples to be found. I assume meaning like this vault. We have to seek them out and discover what lurks within so we can save our world. But we must be careful, as there are still those who would oppose us. And no, I'm not referring to Rodrigo's men. I'm referring to Abstergo. It is done. The message is delivered. We are gone now from this world. All of us. We can do no more. The rest is up to you, Desmond. What? Who is Desmond? Speaking of which, wake up, Desmond. Abstergo's found us. You know it's bad because the credits are rolling over cutscene and gameplay. That means we're in a dire situation. Come on, we've got to get out of here right now. If we take any longer than Vidic's on a- Mr. Miles, it's been far too long. Ran off to go play with robots in Afghanistan, hmm? How rude. You know I miss you when you're gone. You always get so wrapped up in your work and you never pay attention to me. I haven't even gotten to tell you more about what the Templars had a hand in. We even have plans for the future, Mr. Miles. Mark your calendars, because January 6th, 2021 is going to be a very good day for us, Mr. Miles. Tell you what, you've been a good boy to us before, Mr. Miles, so I'll give you a chance. If you give me a kiss on the cheek, I'll let you in the Animus to go to a time where your life wasn't this annoying. What do you say? Okay, Mr. Miles, I'll take that as a no, Mr. Miles, but remember this. Forgot what I was gonna say, Mr. Miles, goodbye. And that ends Assassin's Creed 2. I'll say that while that wasn't a great ending, it was certainly Mr. Miles better than AC1's. But I guess that isn't saying much. Desmond could have woken up to find out he was abandoned and he shat himself in the Animus and that would have been a better ending than one's. It didn't conclude anything, but it did a well enough job to have me invested in the next one. To close off, I really like this game. It's far from a masterpiece, but it's such a good sequel. It lands in that pool of second games that do nearly everything better than the first, at least in my opinion. 
The combat was improved, the stealth was improved, the side content was improved, the characters were improved, the story was improved, I can go on. There are definitely some that stand by AC1 and say that it's the true pinnacle, but I am not one of those people. To me, AC2 is the best that the classic formula has to offer. It gets the high honor of going in A tier. Very well done. Now, the next game, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. I'm probably gonna make some enemies with this one. His mental health is questionable. 